Now, it's a real honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Steve Palumbi from Stanford University. He's director of the Hopkins Marine Station. Um, he's a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation. He's a senior fellow for the Woods Institute for the Environment, and he's a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. He serves on the board of directors for a number of organizations, including the Ocean Conservancy and the Island Press. He received his PhD from the University of Washington in marine ecology. He studies the genetics, evolution, conservation, population biology, and systematics of a diverse array of marine organisms. And his work has taken them to the oceans and seas all around the world. Please join me in welcoming Professor Steve Columbia. Thanks for the invitation, uh, for the, the terrific welcome, and the, the chance today to, to talk to so many people uh, in, in the department. I want to talk about climate change in, in the oceans and the kinds of things that happen there. Um, and, and I want to talk about the science of what we do to, to try to make sense out of what the climate might do in the oceans. And I, I'm going to talk about it in perhaps an unexpectedly and, and um, kind of a rare optimistic way. Not that these are not serious problems because they, they very much are. But I think the way to approach serious problems is, is to look for the solutions, uh, to find the things that we can do and do them. Um, and, and you can't find the things to do uh, until you discover how, uh, in fact, the planet is being affected by climate change. This is the graph of temperatures over the last century, and, and what you can see is that uh, they're going up, and they're going up faster as time, time goes on. Um, but in the oceans, not only is uh, the temperature going up, but the pH is going down. The oceans are getting more acidic over time. And the reason for that is that more CO2 is in the atmosphere. No one, not even climate deniers, deny that. Simple chemistry is that the more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more there is in the ocean. It breaks down into carbonic acid. It makes the ocean more acidic. And if you look at the prediction of what the future ocean will be like, um, you can see that it's a, it's a sort of hot and sour soup in the future. It's warmer by a few degrees, and it's more acidic by a few tenths of a point few tenths of a point actually means almost 50% more actual acidity in the ocean. So that's the ocean that is probably going to be faced by all the world's marine life over the next couple of centuries. Is that going to be a problem? That's what we're here to talk about. Um, and I'm going to specifically talk about corals uh, for a couple of different reasons. I love working on coral reefs. They're stunningly beautiful. They are an inspiration to a large number of people around the world. They also provide a huge amount of food, not that people eat corals, but they provide the habitat for thousands of species to live, and that habitat produces fish for people to eat. Now, coral reef fish is not a big part of what you might get in a menu at a, at a nice restaurant, but subsistence fishing all around the world is often done on coral reefs, and those subsistence fishing fisheries provide about a quarter of the animal protein that those poor people in coastal areas eat. So it's a very important part of the world and the human ecosystem. And some people have put these things together, the importance of coral reefs and the impending change in the climate, and, and said, well, corals are doomed. Uh, many of them are endangered right now, and that global climate change and acidification is, is likely to wipe out coral reefs as major ecosystems over the next 30 or 50 years. Now here's the conundrum about that, because it, that, that conclusion is based on very nice science and, and a projection into the future. How long have these corals been on the planet? They have been here for a quarter of a billion years. They have been through a lot of changes. Now it's quite possible that the changes we are making to the planet are more severe than anything that corals have faced. And I say that it is quite possible that we are doing that. Um, but it's also quite possible that corals have hidden talents that we have not found out yet, and that they have ways of surviving that we have not figured out. And if we can understand the ways corals survive stress, both in temperature and pH, we may learn something about how to preserve these habitats a little bit further into the future. So that's my goal. My goal is to understand the most we can get out of a coral, how much we can expect for them to actually fight off climate change for us. So if you think about how a species will fight off climate change, um, it really can be 
boiled down into, into four things. You can move, acclimate, adapt, or die. And we have seen, in fact, these things playing out, and these are some of the signals that we know from the biological world that climate change is really happening. It's not because you can hear it on the radio or you can read it in the newspaper, but you can read it in where animals and plants live their lives now compared to where they used to. Uh, so, for example, birds, butterflies, mammals, trees, estuarine fish, um, and invertebrates all are moving. They're moving towards the poles as things warm up. They're, they're coming out in the spring a little bit earlier. These changes have been recorded across the planet and um, tell us that the organisms of the planet are perceiving climate change. And you might think, well, the oceans are full of things like that. They can move wherever they want, and they can simply run away from climate change. And that's true for some things like, like blue fin tuna, but it's not true for other kinds of organisms like corals, which are rather cemented down to the ground and can't move at all. Now, corals have one way of moving, and they can move in their larval form. Corals produce small larvae. They're about the shape of a football. They're somewhat smaller. Um, they're about a quarter of a millimeter. And those larvae move around in the oceans, and it's possible that that's a mechanism by which coral populations can move from place to place and, and move ahead of climate change. Uh, we've been studying that in coral populations by looking at the molecular genetics of, of corals from place to place throughout the Pacific. Um, the way you do that is to simply go to far-flung archipelagos in the Pacific that you choose because well, it's a scientifically valid reason for all the choices that I made. <laughs> and um, collect coral samples, extract DNA, and then use modern DNA sequencing to look at the genes of these corals um, and look at the different types of genes, same species, different, different places. So this, these are the areas that we've looked at, I'm going to tell you about so far. They range from on the, on the, on the um, <clears throat> on the west here, uh, to Palmyra Island, a, a, a very isolated spot that's now um, part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and what I call the, the Southern Cross here, an area that includes the Phoenix Islands, Funafuti, uh, Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. These are areas that are thousands of miles apart, but they have the same coral populations, the same coral reefs. The samples uh, that we take from them give us an idea of how much the Pacific can be explored and crossed by the larvae of these corals uh, from generation to generation. The bottom line for this is that the genetic analysis shows that there's not much migration going on. The approach is to look around these archipelagos, see how different the same populations of corals are, and infer the amount of movement. And when you do that, you see maybe one larva every 30 years will manage to cross these big gaps. Now, that is not very much movement. And what it means is that effectively these corals are trapped on their islands. They can't move to the island group next to them. Their population is stuck there. It's not like birds or butterflies that can move along a continent. It's not like fish that can swim thousands of miles. They're stuck. And that means one of the main mechanisms that corals can deal with climate change, movement, is out of the picture for them. They cannot move over large landscapes very well. brings us to the next two topics, adaptation and acclimation. And here, this is where a lot of the action is in ecology and evolutionary biology, not only here at UCLA, around the country, but around the world. If we can understand the, the speed with which populations and species can acclimate and adapt, we can understand the limits that they can deal with in terms of how much climate change they can take. And, and we have lots of examples, particularly on land, of how organisms are evolving in the face of changing climates. Um, and some examples in, in the ocean, particularly in, in coastal crabs. Uh, which brings us back to corals. Because for corals, if they can't move, then how much can they acclimate and how much can they adapt to their particular environment? Well, we began answering these questions, or asking these questions on this, this island. This is Ofu Island. It's part of American Samoa. It, it contains the only U.S. national park south of the equator. Uh, you're looking at the national park. Um, and it has these back reef lagoons, back behind the waves here, that heat up during summer low tides to, to temperatures basically lethal to corals, 31, 32, 34 degrees, um, temperatures that cause coral bleaching in all around the world. So naturally, the lagoons are completely devoid of corals. Um, 
except they're not. <laughs> they don't read the literature, and they don't know <laughs> that they're supposed to be dead. Um, this, is a, this is the conundrum. This is one of those times when you go to a place and you say, this is a surprise. This really shouldn't be true. And then the science is to try to figure out how it can be true, that corals are living in these environments despite the high temperatures that would cause them to roll over and die in, in most other places. So our work was to try to find out how they survive and to try to figure out the mechanisms by which they are living in these, in these areas. Um, as we began exploring this particular island, Ofu, we found that, in fact, the back reef area was not just a homogeneous pool, but it was, in fact, a series of pools, um, and that they had different characteristics themselves. So we could use this environment as essentially an outdoor laboratory, an environmental variation. All the pools are full of corals, and to try to figure out how they were managing to survive conditions we think that should be lethal to them. I'm going to talk about two main pools. There's a large one and a smaller one. And the small one heats up more than the large one. This one heats up two to three degrees hotter than this one at low tide in the summer. Uh, so there's a gradient in temperature uh, that we can, take, we can take advantage of. Well, our basic hypothesis was that these temperature changes might pre-adapt the corals to be able to deal with even stronger changes in um, coral bleach coral bleaching in the future. Um, but we don't know that. One of the first things we had to do then was to find out, were these corals stronger? Were they more resilient than other corals in the world? Uh, we started this by looking at the temperatures in these different pools. And the pools are divided up into the small one, the hot one, and the cool one. It's not that these pools are always hot. It's they're variable, particularly low tide. During the day, uh, they get um, remarkably hot. So warm when you get into them, you think, oh, I've stepped into a bathtub. But the thing is, that amount of temperature does, that temperature does not last that long. Um, we can look at the environment of the small pool and compare it to the big pool. It has more days that are hotter. It has a uh, much higher temperature in general, and it's got much longer bouts of high temperature. Environmentally, we can, we can describe these areas pretty well. Um, but there's another factor going on in these, in these environments, too. So far, I've been to telling you strictly about, about temperature. But we're also interested, because of ocean acidification, in what's going on in terms of the pH of these pools. And this has been another surprise to us. Uh, the reason for concern for ocean acidification around the world is that when you grow marine organisms in slightly more acidic seawater, and about 120 studies have been done like this around the world, you see in general that uh, for survival, growth, calcification, um, and reproduction, that organisms do worse in more acidic seawater, that there's a price they pay for the ocean acidification that is likely to be, to be coming. Um, well, we wanted to know what was going on in OFU in terms of of, a, of acidification, what the conditions were of pH uh, on the reef. Uh, we've got a set of pH meters out there on the reef. Uh, these were put in by the National Park Service, and Peter Craig in particular at the National Park Service has been monitoring these areas for, for quite a while. And I'm just going to take you through a day very quickly of temperature and pH. This is um, the back reef lagoon at dawn in Ofu. It's the day before Christmas. Um, 29 degrees, pH 8.1. It is nirvana for corals there, the right temperature um, and, and the, right, the right pH. But as the day goes by, uh, the temperature spikes up, up to 33 degrees in this pool, and the pH also spikes up. It goes alkaline. Now, we never expected the pH to go up. Ocean acidification is the pH going down. This pH is going up. Uh, by 6 p.m., the temperature's coming down. The pH is still up. By, by midnight, when Santa comes to Ofu, uh, the temperature's back down. The pH is, is back down, and um, things are back to where they were. It is the acidity of this back reef area is changing. Well, how is it changing? It turns out, when we begin to look into this question, that although a lot of attention has been paid to how pH affects marine organisms, a lot less attention has been paid to the flip side how marine organisms affect pH. And it turns out a healthy marine environment like this one, in its metabolism, can affect the pH of the area around it. 
So what's happening here is at high tide, the ocean, which has this normal pH, is flooding the pools and the pH isn't changing. At low tide, the pools are cut off. <coughs> and the biology of the reef is beginning to affect the pH of the area quite a bit. At low tide, during the night, there's a lot of metabolism. CO2 is being uh, put into the environment by corals and plants and everything, and it depresses the pH. It brings it down, makes it more acidic. Just like the CO2 we put in the atmosphere makes for ocean acidification, the, the metabolism of reef organisms at night bring the pH down. But at, in the daytime, the reverse happens. Photosynthesis pulls CO2 out of the water. The CO2 levels drop. The pH goes back up. And so at low tide during the day, the pH is changed by the organisms in those back reef pools and um, pushes the pH well above its normal level, makes it much more alkaline. So what that means is that real reefs have curves. They don't, corals don't live in environments that are totally stable. They live in a variable temperature environment and a variable pH environment. Now suppose we compare that to the kinds of environments that these corals are likely to see in the next century. Ofu corals are seeing a temperature range during the day that is essentially going to be the range that climate change gives us in a century. If we look at the pH, the predicted pH across the ocean is going to drop. Uh, that's well below what the corals usually see in Ofu right now. Um, but it may be that a healthy reef environment, if we can protect them and let them remain healthy, a healthy reef environment is capable of keeping the pH up here instead of letting it drop down here. We don't know that that's the case. But what it tells us is that simple predictions about constant pH or temperature in the ocean are not likely to be true, and we have to understand how these variable conditions affect corals in order to make predictions into the future. So our project there on OFU, uh, in addition to monitoring the environment and trying to set an idea of what's going on, has been to look at corals and to try to understand how they are reacting to, to their environment. We, we basically came to a stunning conclusion a few, about two years ago when we started setting up this project that corals are more like plants than they are like animals. I study marine animals, whales and sharks and fish, and they move around, and as a population biologist, I tend to study them as groups of animals together, populations. But these animals are cemented down they're there for the long term. Each of, each of these is probably about 50 years old. And we can get to know them personally. We don't have to treat them as anonymous groups. We can treat them as known individuals mapped and followed over time. So that's what we've been doing in the OFU project is talking, is, is mapping corals and understanding their relationship to their, their environment. So we know they're alive. We know that the, the pools are variable in temperature. Does this mean that those corals are stronger in the face of coming climate change? Are they stronger in the face of potential bleaching events where uh, heat induces the corals to, to turn white and die? In order to find that out, we needed to set up a, a series of experiments. This is a former graduate student of mine, Tom Oliver, in OFU, setting up a set of recirculating reef tanks um, that we can place corals in and change the temperature. So some of these tanks we leave at their normal temperature. The other tanks we adjust it up to the normal kinds of temperatures that we would expect these corals to see in the year 2100, about two and a half degrees warmer. And the question was, what happens to the OFU corals when we put them in these simulated bleaching events? Are they stronger than we would expect? And, and the answer is that they're not all stronger than we'd expect. Some of them, in fact, are still quite sensitive to bleaching. By the way, they're called tabletop acropora. Some of you, if you've been snorkeling in the Pacific or diving, may have seen them. They're, they're, they're like the sequoias of the reef. They grow slowly uh, and they grow quickly. They grow big. They're very old. And you know you've got a nice, healthy reef when you have a lot of really big tabletop corals from the large pool. Over a simulated bleaching event, about half of them die. That's still better than most reefs, so they, they are a bit stronger. But it's a little disappointing because they, they didn't pick up a huge amount of extra strength from being in this high um, heat environment. Uh, but the corals from the smaller pool perform much, much better. Mortality rates in the small pool corals are really low. It means that they're strengthened. They have a lot of resilience in the face of future bleaching events, much more than we would have thought. Now, the important, another important thing about corals is that they are not alone. I think of them as animals. 
Other coral biologists think of them as plants uh, because even though they are an animal, and these are the tentacles of a coral, inside those polyps are these little golden balls here, and those are single-celled algae. And one of the reasons coral reefs are so productive is that those algae photosynthesize, and they make food for the coral, and those algae can actually be quite different from one another depending upon what type of algae the coral has. And among the different kinds of algae that live inside corals, there's a couple of uh, very, very cleverly named types, C and D. The important thing for our purposes is that C is a normal sort of heat sensitive alga, but D is heat tolerant. It can take a degree or two more heat and not bleach than, than C can. So one of the ways the corals might actually be changing in our pools is by switching out symbionts, switching out their algae. When we began to look at that, was is in fact true. The same species in the hotter pool tends to have these heat tolerant algae in it. So that's one of the reasons why they're probably able to survive a little bit more in those, in those pools. Not only are the algae a bit different from pool to pool, but the corals themselves have either adapted or acclimated to these pools and so have a higher strength, a higher resilience in the face of future bleaching events. So first bit of information is the pools differ in environment and there's lots of corals. The second bit of information is that the corals that are there are resistant to future uh, bleaching scenarios. Uh, the third bit of information is that that, that power, that resilience, comes both from the algae and the coral itself. The next sort of thing we want to try to figure out is wh what the relationship is between the coral and the algae. Uh, we can do that by measuring the photosynthetic efficiency of the algae. This is Tom with something called a PAM fluorometer. Um, essentially seeing how well the algae is photosynthesizing, how well it's using sunlight and turning sunlight into food. So there is still a decline in the health of these corals in simulated bleaching events, but the decline is a lot smaller in the small pool than the large pool, essentially the same kind of result we got from, from mortality. So uh, there's a difference. It resides in the coral. It also resides in the algae. Our next set of goals is to try to find out what is it about those corals that, that really makes a difference and how we might then uh, understand the differences between these corals in terms of mechanism. But before we were doing that, uh, here we are on a small island in the middle of the Pacific, and as, as Dan said, I'm very much in favor of scientists telling people what they know. If, if I know a huge amount about the corals in Ofu, um, and I don't tell anybody about it, well then it's, it's as if the knowledge doesn't exist. And in this particular case, um, Ofu has a little bit of a problem. It's a very small island, has a very small runway and a very small airport. The people on the island would rather have a bigger runway because the only plane in American Samoa that can land on that runway is the governor's. And the governor is stingy <laughs> with his plane. So they would like the runway to be extended so that they can land larger planes, maybe get some tourists, not scientists who never tip. Um, and herein lies the problem. The runway can be extended forward or back. If, we, if they extended the runway back, it would extend into the harbor. No big deal. There's not much living there. Guess what's right in front of the runway? Guess which coral? <laughs> the strongest corals we know on the planet. I mean, the corals that have the, the biggest resistance to climate change that we know. These corals from this one pool, the small pool, um, you can't see the runway is here. It ends there. And so if they were to extend it, it would basically wipe out all of that. So um, we, we began talking to the governor's office. We're using his plane, after all. Um, and, uh, and realized that it wasn't just about the governor's office and his staff, but it was about, about the people of Samoa too. Why should they care? Why should they make a, make a difference? Why should they change the way they were going to build a runway because of these silly, silly corals? Um, so I work with a film company in, in uh, the Bay Area, um, and we do these things, Dan said, called micro-documentaries. It's a, it's a production company we started called the Short Attention Span Science Theater. Uh, <laughs> it, 
See, it works, and, and people get it. Uh, you can find them on the web. The website is just microdocs.org or Short Attention Span Science Theater. Um, the site, the website is very popular. It gets millions of hits a year. Um, and we decided we'd make a micro documentary about why it's important for coral reefs to be strong. And we, we, we kicked around a couple of different ideas about how we could get people's attention about this, uh, what sort of things we could talk about climate change, we could talk about uh, the importance of reef to biodiversity and how pretty they were and all the tourists who would never come to Ofu anyway. Um, and so we hit upon a different theme for our micro documentary that we thought would really maybe make a big difference. And that theme is pride. The governor of American Samoa has taken that around the world and showed it uh, and shown it. Um, because it links something about their culture uh, with something in their, in their natural environment. And, and it's just one of the ways that we're trying to, to take the science and discovery that these are very strong and resilient corals and, and make that make a difference to the people that actually are there all the time. Um, it's that kind of, of linking that I think science has to do. We can't just tell people what we think they need to know about our science. We have to relate it to how they live their lives, and we have to make it relevant to, the, to what they think is important. Um, film is a very powerful medium to do that, and, and I think this kind of, of blending of culture and science is something that, um, that can help us get these messages across. Okay. But do we actually know what's going on on these reefs? Um, we know there's a phenomenon happening, but we don't know a couple of really important things. We don't know whether these reefs, these corals, the ones here, are special and no other corals in the world are like them. If we knew that, we would make another video um, and, and really try to protect these even, even more strongly. Or it could be that any coral on the planet, if it lived here, would be strong. We don't, know the we don't know the answer to that very, very basic question. How much of this difference is acclimation, the ability of an individual in a stressful environment to, to, to become stronger, and how much of it is adaptation, that would, would, things that would only be found here? So what we're doing now, and, and I can't give you the answer to that, but I just want to show you how we're going about it, is to focus on individual corals, and to look at how these organisms are responding to the environment. Now, we'll do that in two separate ways. Uh, to look at acclimation and adaptation, the way we're going to look at these questions involves coral genomics. Uh, over the last five to ten years, uh, genomic capacity has increased by such a degree that, um, well, in my own lab, PhD students from 10 years ago would be producing X amount of data. Uh, now I can have an undergraduate class, a lab, produce that much data in an afternoon. Um, it's just an amazing thing. So some of you have heard of Moore's Law, where computing capacity goes up, doubles every 10 years or so. Well, the ability to sequence DNA has gone up by about a factor of 10 every two years for the last couple. It's amazingly different now. And we can use that power to look at things we could never look at before. Victoria talked about the Human Genome Project, uh, which ushered in an era where we can look at the genomes of many other organisms um, in a very powerful way. So we don't even know what the genome of these corals are. We, we have a hard time picking out the genome of the coral from the genome of the symbiont. And it turns out there's a lot of other stuff living in there that we didn't know about. A lot of protists, fungi, bacteria, all this stuff comes rushing out of the sequencer. Once we begin to sort all that out, we begin to find out where the coral genes are. And we have about 30,000 uh, bits of coral genes now. They're called uh, contigs. Uh, and they're just sequences of DNA that we know are in the coral genome that are expressed, genes that corals use to do, to, to do their their daily stuff. Now, the sequencers that we're using uh, produce an incredible volume of tiny, tiny little bits of data. The data are about 35 bases long. Um, and what we're going to try to do is use those little tiny bits of data to reassemble the way individual corals uh, are genetically and in terms of gene expression patterns. So uh, we, these machines spit out all this stuff. 
uh, the computers assemble them into bits like this. Um, and by letting them overlap, these tiny little bits, you can begin to build a picture of what all these genes are in each individual coral. Now, it would be like taking, um, taking Michener's Hawaii, big book, um, and then taking, taking the pages and, and ripping it all up until you just got little pieces of paper with, with 36 letters. And you're going to have like all the books in the used bookstore, because there's a lot of Michener's Hawaii in the used bookstore. <laughs> and you take all those, you rip all those up, and you start putting them together. And if you have enough copies, you can begin piling all those 36 letter runs on top of one another. And you can reassemble Michener's Hawaii that way. It's not easy. <laughs> But it can be done, and with a huge amount of DNA sequencing and a huge amount of computing power, you can reconstruct the, the transcriptome, the genes expressed of an individual coral uh, from its position on the reef. So that's what we're beginning to do. Uh, we've had our first sets of runs um, for these. And another bit of data that you get out of it is that the, the, the individual reads, the letters, are not exactly the same. It would be like two editions of Michener's Hawaii. And those two editions, you could line up, and they'd be a little different from one another, but they would still line up. And the same is true of DNA sequences. They line up, but they're a little bit different. In this case, there's A's and G's in there, and that represents two different bases in the DNA sequence. And this little A and G would tell us that this individual had a genetic variant there. One chromosome had an A in that place, and the other chromosome had a G in that place, and that would give us its genotype at that little place. It's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, and we can score those polymorphisms in coral genes. So the same data would tell us about how the genes are expressed also tell us what the genotype is of individual corals at not just one of these SNPs, but a lot of them. And that's very powerful data as well. So what we're trying to do is pull together these little bits um, our pilot data set uh, was on five colonies uh, from OFU. Um, this is, these are all in the big pool. And the big pool is variable like t from time to time, but it's also variable in space. There are, little, there are hot spots in the big pool and cool spots in the big pool. So we're interested in not only what the genotypes are and the gene expression patterns, but what the... Oops, um, what the, in, <clears throat> what the environment is like. So here's a graph of the environment of these five corals. The way we do that is by putting temperature loggers on the base of each coral. The logger sits there and records the temperature every two minutes. Um, and this, these, this is a data set we collected last February. It's for a whole t low tide series. And what I've recorded here is the amount of time this coral spent above bleaching temperature, about three hours for this one during that low tide cycle and less than a minute for this one. So these corals live in different microclimates. And we can use that to try to understand how each of these corals, is how the genetics and the gene expression patterns are related to, to environment at the individual level. We can also take these corals and expose them to stress and try to understand what genes are being turned on when they encounter stress. We measure the gene expression in heated corals and in control corals. And these are the genes that get turned on by corals when they are exposed to heat. Um, what are their names? Some of them have nice sounding names, like heat shock protein. So the heat shock protein 70 pops up a lot in this particular set of data. Um, there's, there's probably many alleles or many loci for that. It's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. There are other genes as well. Um, there's a nucleoporin that makes the traffic things back and forth in and out of the nucleus. Um, there's a lipase. This is a, an enzyme that changes the fat composition of the membranes. And we know that the fat composition of the membranes in the symbiont is very important to allowing them to function during high heat. So somehow the corals are turning on the enzyme that will change the fat composition. Uh, there are things like this uh, threonine protein kinase CBK1. I have the slightest idea what that is. Um, some of you, I'm hoping I left these up so some of you in the room might know what some of these genes are. Um, part, of the, part of the communication problem that science has is not just between scientists and the general public, but be, 
be, uh, between sinus in one building and sinus in another building. And so the, the, the back and flow between ecology evolution and cell biology is sometimes deficient. So I, can, I don't know what a coil helix, coiled, coiled helix domain is <laughs> either. But it sounds cool. We can also look at the genotypes of individual corals one at a time. Now, the power of this analysis is not that we've got one or two places in the genome we can look at genotypes. This is a data set of 4,636 places in the coral genome where we have data on the genotypes and the variation among individuals uh, for these genotypes. If you take that amount of data, it's too much to even look at in a spreadsheet, so you run it through a computer program that gives you the principal components of how the variation changes from individual to individual. And understanding a little bit about how each of these corals differ in, the, in their individual genetics, we can begin to put that together with what they're doing individually with their gene expression patterns and where they're living to try to figure out what genes are, are controlling or participating in this, this change. And, and knowing if it's hardwired genes, um, like the single nucleotide polymorphisms that explain the result, or whether it's shifting gene expression patterns, tells us the difference between whether it's adaptation, that would be very location specific, or acclimation, which maybe most corals could do. So we're trying to tease those out by applying genomics to this, this particular question. Um, we have a couple other things that we can do with this system that makes it very handy. Uh, this is coral number 40, transplanted from where it was growing quite happily to another pool. Uh, we can basically glue it down with the same sort of stuff you use to repair your swimming pool. And they live, they grow. And we can then take corals that were living in very different environments, bring them to the same place, and then see whether or not, if they live in the same place, they react the same way. So we're worried about corals because of the future climate. We're worried about them because their, their ecosystems are dramatically important to people in, in a lot of different ways. But when we go around the world, we notice that there are some places where corals are already under stress. And they're, they're not all dead. A lot of them are. But they're not all dead. And understanding how the ones that are not all dead yet have remained alive gives us a way to try to understand what the future might hold. It's one thing to say, well, I don't know how corals could live above 31 degrees, so they must all be, they must all going to be die, dead in, in 10 years. You could say that. Or you could say, boy, there's some places in the world where they are living above 31 degrees, and I want to know why, so that I can understand what the future might hold with a little bit more, a little bit more data. We found out that it's the algae that matter and the coral that matter. Um, we found out that um, individual microclimates of corals differ and that when we begin to focus on corals as individuals, long-lived individuals on these reefs, we have with the genomic tools the ability to understand not only how that individual corals manage to live there and thrive, whether it's adapted, whether it's acclimating, and from that information be able to tell whether other corals in the world might be able to do the same. Studying this in Ofu is, cannot be the end. We're doing it there because, A, it's stunningly beautiful, and B, um, it's a fabulous laboratory for doing these studies that we really couldn't do almost anywhere else that, that I've been. But once we know the beginning of the answers in Ofu, the idea will be to take this to other places and look for other places in the world that have high temperature pools, that have high temperature environments, that have thriving reefs and stressful areas and then use the same kinds of approaches in those places to try to understand whether they have very strong corals as well. Last, um, we cannot just let information like this sit in, in science buildings. We have to get information like this out, not only to audiences like you, but to audiences in places where corals are not only part of the native culture, but part of the legacy for the future of those people, and, and bringing them into the discussion, bringing them in to the work that we have to do to preserve corals in the future is something I think we can all join in. Thanks a lot.